Good morning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the deprogramming language. Um, more specifically, uh, one of the compilers of, that implements the language, um, the D front end for GCC, or GDC. Uh, my name's Ian Bucklaw. Uh, I am effectively the principal force behind the GDC project and have been maintaining it since 2009. Uh, during this time, I have uh, both updated the language from uh, D version 1 to D version 2, as well as keeping it up to date with the latest GCC uh, releases. I think at the time when I started, uh, we only supported uh, GCC 3.4 and maybe partial support for 4.1. And what I've been doing is just, you know, for each iterative release, uh, keeping it up to date from there. So, um, in no particular structure, I'll be giving an overview of the language and the compiler uh, in the order of who, what, and how. Uh, now, warning, you know, I am a D guy. I will be presenting the deprogramming language in a rather flattering light. Um, should I wish to, I could say a lot of bad stuff about it, but for the purpose of the court, you know, just take what I say with a pinch of salt. So, uh, who's using D? Um, so, uh, Symmetry Investments is a financial company. Uh, they have a reporting language uh, named SIL uh, that's using uh, PEGT. Uh, PEGT is a par uh, parsing expression grammar library which generates code at compile time. Uh, they're currently in the midst of rewriting all their C++ code base into D. Uh, Sabamba. Uh, Sabamba isn't a company per se, They're they are an open source project. Uh, but they were sort of uh, developed under the umbrella of the Open Bioinformatics uh, Foundation. Uh, it was a Google Summer of Code project um, with the University of Utrecht and uh, Illumina, which I think is the largest bioinformatics company in the world. Um, their software, Savamba, is used in sequencing centers uh, world over. It has had over 70 cit citations in research papers and is thought to be running uh, somewhere in the world every second. Uh, Funkwerk, um, if you've ever caught a bus or a train in Germany, you've probably looked at a timetable. Uh, that information is given to you um, by Funkwerk. Uh, all their systems uh, are written in D. Um, also, a no small note here. Uh, sorry, does this work? Yes. Uh, this line count of uh, what the code is, is only 6% of what they've written. Uh, the other 40% that's missed out is actually sort of um, unit tests. Uh, eBay have also dabbled in it. Uh, they uh, have open sourced uh, TSV utilities. These are tools that deal with uh, tabular data files. Um, I'm not sure what sort of size they deal with, but in the benchmarks they uh, tested with you know, files of the size of 4.8 gig. Uh, with 86 million rows. Um, they were outperforming uh, similar tools written in C, Go, and Rust, uh, including GNU Orc, Datamash, uh, CSV TK, and XSV. Um, part of the reason I sort of give credit to this is their heavy use of LTO and PGO, which aren't really even features of the D language. Uh, Weka, uh, they are a um, Israeli-based company who uh, have been labelled as the world's fastest parallel uh, file system uh, for high-performance computing. Uh, they boast a rather moderate code size, and this, what sort of kept their size down is probably likely helped by their heavy use of compile time introspection and evaluation. And lastly, uh, Sociomantic, uh, they're probably one of the oldest commercial adopters um, alongside Funk Funkberg of the deprogramming language. Um, just to sort of give you a brief overview of kind of the traffic that we deal with uh, in real time. So uh, during peak hours, we're probably getting 300,000 requests a second, and our bidding system is typically taking two milliseconds or less to make a decision. So what made these organizations choose D? Um, well, in the previous slides, I've sort of you know, slung around the words, outperform, fastest, real time. Um, but by all means, uh, when it comes to runtime performance, the deprogramming language isn't really faster. Uh, the, the mentioned companies could have replicated their success in any other native language, but um, th our selling point, I'd probably say in a nutshell, is um, we try to strike a balance between convenience, modeling power, and efficiency uh, without trading off for uh, safety and program productivity. Uh, to use an analogy, um, one person who I met at a um, 
a D language meetup, uh, they were saying that when they start, typically when they start a new project, uh, they would do all the rapid prototyping in Python. And once all the logic was sound, they then you know, rewrite that in C++ and try it to production. As a trial, uh, one day they used D instead for rapid prototyping. Um, and they were so impress impressed by the finished prototype that that went immediately live, cutting their development time in half. Hence, fast code, fast. Um, growing popularity may also be another factor. Um, certainly what I've seen over the last you know, eight, nine years is like a small domino effect where one company who succeeds triggers um, another company in the same industry to then go investigate. So for instance, you know, we wouldn't have uh, the likes of Ubi, Ubisoft uh, talking at Munich this year had um, Remedy not actually, actually release a game with some decode inside. Um, although we're still relatively niche, um, steady growth uh, is not really stopping. Um, although this sudden peak, which I've, uh, I've lost the marker, well, this is something that you see on the far right-hand side. Uh, especially looks like our um, CI infrastructure rather than actual people downloading the compiler. Uh, likewise, active development of the language has not shown any sign of slowing down in the last five years. And our contributor base has kind of relatively maintained a stable size of about 30 people. Um, as an overview of the compiler itself, um, so we're written in uh, 100,000 lines of code uh, spread across 101 source files. I actually did a comparison of other uh, GCC front ends, so uh, C, uh, just the C part itself, not the C family. Uh, is I counted 35,000 lines of code, the Go front end 47,000, C++ 130, Fortran 144,000. Uh, Ada, I didn't know how to count. Um, conservatively, I'm, I'm ballpark 300,000 lines of code. Uh, so I don't think we're doing too bad with our uh, size. Uh, there's also a pretty vibrant community. There's currently uh, over 300, 300 1,300 uh, projects which are registered in our package repository. Our package repository is fairly new, um, so that's probably not representative of all the software uh, out there. Um, and we currently have uh, 74 sponsors and backers on Open Collective. Um, generating more or less about 5,000 uh, 5, per annum uh, towards the D Language Foundation. Uh, this is only uh, based on public reports. I don't know what private investors are uh, giving to us. Also in the community, we have our own mascot. And we've been holding an annual uh, D Language conference since uh, 2013. Um, these have been held in Menlo Park and Utah University in the US, as well as Berlin and Munich in Germany. Uh, here we are as one big happy family uh, in Berlin and again uh, earlier this year in Munich. Um, we've also had the language ported to quite a number of architectures uh, in that time. Uh, we definitely have functional support for x86, ARM and ARM64. Um, bare minimum has been done for PowerPC, SystemZ and MIPS. Uh, still waiting for Spark, looking at you. And uh, this demo running uh, is on a ARM Cortex-M. Uh, the author has told me that uh, this program has no dependencies whatsoever. Uh, so there's no CRT startup files, no libgcc or glibc, uh, no vendor peripheral libraries. Everything that's been controlled, the random generated rectangles and the flashing LED lights, is written in D. So to give you sort of a brief overview of the language, um, so uh, D is a high-level systems programming language. Uh, it is written in a higher level uh, than C++, but we still try to retain uh, the ability to write low-level code. Uh, it has support for multi-paradigm programming, such as imperative, structured, object-oriented, generic, lazy, and functional. Um, it comes with a garbage collector, boo, um, and has built in a unit testing and documentation framework. Um, what will follow here is basically just a brief overview of the surface of the language with a slight affinity towards the ABI and what um, GDC as a, as a compiler is generating. So, kinds of type. Uh, every single basic type uh, is a fixed size except for real, uh, which uh, maps to the long double type node. Um, 
pointers, static arrays, as you'd probably expect. Uh, static arrays are actually passed around by value. They do not saturate to a pointer. Um, we also have uh, convenience types, uh, whose underlying ABI, uh, the, the data layout, is an aggregate. Um, so, for instance, we have dynamic arrays, which consist of a, of a size uh, T length and a pointer. Uh, associative arrays um, are a runtime defined type. Uh, we actually know nothing about its contents, we just pass around the internal pointer. And delegates are exactly the same as a function pointer, except they come with a context. Uh, this context could be a stack frame or a closure or a, this pointer for a, a method. Um, we, and we also provide vector support where the hardware says yes. Um, aliases are, are equivalent to uh, C type def. Uh, you have two alternative syntax. Um, enums are used to encapsulate any kind of compile time constant. Um, if a given data type can be represented at compile time, then it can be stored into an enum. Uh, for instance, you can have floating point or strings. Uh, structs are C ABI compatible, uh, except if they're nested. Um, they're passed around by value and their lifetime is deterministic. Uh, unions are the same as structs except all fields are at offset zero. Um, if you want to do object-oriented programming, um, indeed, you use a class. Uh, classes are reference types distinct from structs and are typically allocated on the GC. Uh, with classes, you can only inherit from one other class. If you want multiple inheritance, uh, that's when you... Uh, uh, that's where interfaces come in. Uh, interfaces can only contain declarations of members, which must be implemented by the class, or non-virtual member functions. Um, and lastly, just ranges, whilst not being a built-in language type, um, the compiler is aware of them. Uh, so, so for instance, uh, a for-each loop construct, so for-each LM, range uh, will be loaded by the compiler as for um, range uh, not empty, uh, range pop front, and then in the first line of the body, lm equals uh, range dot front. Uh, ranges are lazy. Um, they don't need to evaluate or allocate uh, the data which it's wrapped around until requested. Um, the various different kinds that we have, uh, oh, bear in mind for I put interface here. Uh, ranges are typically struct types. Uh, just use interface so you can see uh, the relationship between them. Uh, so an input range models a kind of uh, iteration where uh, elements are accessed in, in a sequence. Uh, forward ranges provides a way to copy the internal state, and iterating over an input range may be destructive. Uh, a bi uh, bidirectional range uh, allows you to do for each reverse. Uh, and a random access range, you have both infinite and finite. Um, now, uh, dynamic arrays uh, can be can work seamlessly with random access um, ranges. So any algorithm which you write in the library which uh, accepts a, a random access range, you can also throw any dynamic array into that. Kinds of expressions. So, um, by and large, uh, we sort of tend to go with, uh, if it looks like C, it follows C semantics. Um, or throws a compiler error. So I'll just briefly gloss over uh, things which are slightly different. So uh, we have equality and identity. Uh, equality is a comparison of value. Identity is usually gets lower to, to a mem comp. Uh, you also have a uniform function call syntax. Um, both of these functions which I've got here are equivalent. Um, you also have the uh, power operator. Uh, this, if it can't be evaluated at compile time, it will be forwarded to um, standard math pal. Uh, casting requires the explicit use of a keyword. Um, U, if you want to allocate on the GC. Uh, and we also have uniform construction syntax for basic types. Uh, dynamic arrays also come with their own operators, uh, concat and append. Um, array copy is different from an assignment. Uh, if you sort of note the brackets here, uh, if they come without brackets, uh, A would actually be pointing to the same memory as B. Um, associate arrays also have their own uh, convenience words. This here just gets lowered to a function call, um, which either returns uh, a pointer to the slot in the associate array or null if, it, if not found. 
Uh, there's also syntactical sugar for uh, constructing associated arrays. Uh, what we do is, in the order of you know, key value, key value, uh, what we do in the compiler is collect all the keys, throw it into one dynamic array, collect all the values, throw it into another dynamic array, throw that to a function which then returns us um, a pointer with the uh, layout. Uh, all strings in D are dynamic arrays uh, under the hood, and we also have function literals uh, that come in two different syntaxes. Uh, the latter being just a more of a convenience uh, if you only uh, returning one expression. Um, all global uh, data uh, variables in the D language are thread local. Um, here, the, the use of the static keyword doesn't really have much effect on the top level um, module. Um, it does not have the same meaning as in C. Uh, all symbols are still public within the translation unit. Um, if you uh, want to have, it, have things uh, data accessible across multiple threads, uh, you have two uh, keywords for that. Uh, shared, the uh, closest approximation, um, really sort of means atomic, as in uh, it is free of data races, therefore violating that means a compiler error. Um, but for most people, though, uh, you really just want to bind to C without any of the baggage, so there's G-shared for that purpose. Uh, there's also a mutable, uh, which is really initialized once. Uh, the data isn't really read-only, but you have the guarantee that once set, its value never changes for the remainder of its lifetime. Um, const is a kind of bridge in between uh, mutable data and immutable. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, shared, immutable, and const, uh, they are transitive types. That is, you know, uh, if you apply const on uh, a pointer, it, it is const all the way down to the most base element. Um, well, uh, I can skip over these. They're sort of as C, really. Uh, lazy parameters, uh, they are lowered to um, a delegate. And... Oh, and all uh, variables uh, get a default initializer. Uh, if you want to explicitly n leave a variable uninitialized, then you must provide equals void. Um, functions also have their own attributes. Um, just to pick out one here, pure, the pure attribute is not quite the same as pure in the C sense. Uh, a pure function is allowed to modify its parameters, thereby having a side effect. Um, D comes with, with its own memory security model, uh, safe. Uh, safe means that it is impossible for a function to corrupt memory. Um, as such, uh, in safe functions, you cannot do things like uh, casts that break the type system, uh, point at arithmetic, or take the address of local variables, um, or call other unsafe functions. Uh, you also have uh, variadics, so uh, D style variadic. Um, how that works is that at the call site, uh, the first named parameter is um, it, it's actually a dynamic array of type information objects that describe the variadic parameters that follow. Uh, then inside the function, uh, we then create the VA list uh, from, from that uh, and with try finally constructs. Uh, there are also pragmas. Uh, pragmas are a way for vendors to add uh, extensions to the language. Uh, currently, we don't really support anything uh, that's uh, not defined outside the spec. Um, here, uh, pragma inline uh, maps to always inline attribute for GCC. Uh, we also get templates. Templates are D's approach to generic programming. Um, this is how an explicit template looks like, and this is how you initialize it with a bang. Uh, initialize it, instantiate it even <laughs> with a bang. Um, there's also type specialization. Um, here, the type argument uh, must be a dynamic array, uh, to which T is then the base element type. Uh, you also get deduction from uh, specialization, which can provide values for uh, more than one parameter. Um, you can also turn any user-defined type into a template. Um, the same goes for functions as well. And uh, you, or we also have variadic templates, uh, which work by allowing only one kind of type to be passed variably. Um, note there is no comma here. Uh, 
we also have uh, the extern keyword, uh, can be used to bind to other language AVIs. Uh, C is very well supported and allows uh, direct access to existing C libraries. Uh, there's also been a lot of work done uh, in the language to support seamlessly uh, integrating with C++. Um, so as well as uh, declaring variables um, and functions with C++ linkage, uh, you can also say what namespace it is part of. Um, you are, we're also um, aware of uh, abbreviations within STL. Uh, you can also mark templates as extern C++. And we can even go as far as um, uh, calling C++ constructors, destructors, and operators where there is semantic equivalence between C++ and D. Uh, so as well as opcast, we also have yeah, op unary, op binary, op assign, uh, op op assign. Um, how, where there isn't support for a particular AVI, um, assuming that the calling conventions just match, uh, you can always just do it yourself with a Pragma Mangle. So uh, here we seem to be wanting to bind to a Fortran library. So uh, D in D, um, we have the concept of modules. Um, one module maps to one source file. Uh, it is Effectively, just a namespace for all declarations contained within. Uh, you can give a module an explicit name or let the compiler infer one uh, from a relative file path. Uh, the import keyword uh, binds to all symbols from one module into the namespace of another. Uh, imports are by default private. Uh, if you want symbols imported to be, uh, to be visible uh, from another module which imports you, then you use the public keyword. Uh, static imports uh, require you to use the full uh, module path to reference its symbols. Uh, alternatively, uh, you could give a, an import a local qualified name or uh, import specific symbols from the module instead. Uh, at a module level, you can apply three levels of access uh, by default. All symbols are public. Um, these accessibility tributes, uh, they don't really alter symbol visibility. Uh, all symbols are public in the object file, even when marked private. Uh, why, um, with separate compilation, you could have it that a private function is only accessed through a public template. Uh, modules also come with uh, con constructors and destructors. Uh, it is in here where you may initialize immutable data. Uh, we have two, uh, one for per, that's executed per thread, and another that's executed in the main thread only. Uh, metaprogramming is... Um, supported by giving you templates, compile time function evaluation, and string mix-ins. Uh, so we have static if, static for each, static assert, which do exactly the same as their runtime counterparts, except um, at compile time, and they do not introduce a new scope. Uh, we also have temper constraints, um, which uh, they are conditions that must be evaluated uh, to true at compile time uh, after the arguments have been matched. Uh, we also have the is expression, which is a condition on the type. Uh, you can mix uh, is with uh, type specialization. Uh, traits are a extension to the language um, which enable programs to get at compile time information that is normally internal to the compiler. Uh, string mixins. Uh, we don't have macros, but, but we do have string mixins which allow you to. Uh, it, it compiles uh, strings as decode. Uh, similarly, we have template mixins uh, which. Uh, Inside can contain a list of declarations, useful for injecting parameterized boilerplates code into the current context. And to avoid collisions, you can also put mixins into a namespace. Uh, lastly, uh, contracts are a set of conditions that must evaluate as true. Uh, you have precondition contracts, uh, postcondition contracts, um, and you can have an arbitrary number of these uh, for each function. Um, they also mix with inheritance as well. So in a class with um, overriding methods, um, in contracts only require that one is satisfied, therefore overriding functions loosen the, um, the, the contract given. Uh, conversely, out contracts require that all are satisfied, therefore overriding functions tighten the constraints of your function. Uh, invariance. Uh, they're a way to validate the state of a class or a struct. Uh, they, when you mix them with uh, in, and out, uh, in and out contracts, uh, when you call a, a function, uh, a method, um, they're executed in the order of first the in contracts are executed, then the invariant, then the function body is run, 
And when you return the result, then the out contract, no, so, sorry, first the invariant is called, then the, then the out contracts. Um, yes? Sorry? What's, what is the response to uh, violating an invariant or a contract? Um, a error is thrown. An exception? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so also, just bear in mind that you know, um, during uh, release mode, we can also use this information to sort of say that, you know, hey, you know, these are the, the constraints, uh, input and output constraints of the function. Therefore, it's useful, uh, it potentially useful information for the optimizer to then aggressively drill down on that. So uh, we know that we will never get uh, a value outside of this domain. Uh, we also, uh, so asserts are built in, um, and unit tests are a, a framework uh, within D, which uh, of test cases used to verify that a module is working. Uh, if turned on, all unit test blocks are, um, are ran before the main function is executed. So, on to, uh, let's have a look at the compiler. Um, so, hello. going on here. Claims to be connected. Can I change my output resolution? Can I change my output resolution? Um. Oh, excellent. Okay, touch nothing. Okay, so, uh, oof, yeah, quickly. Oh, great. <laughs> Cut off right there. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, you can't see, unfortunately, but um, originally, so, so the author of, of the day, um, programming language uh, wanted to actually name the language Mars. Um, but because friends of Walter kept on calling it D, eventually that stuck and uh, it was released and made open source. Um, very quickly uh, after DMD was released, um, there was a lot of work. Uh, I say a lot of work. You know, people tried to get it working with GCC um, with sort of initial attempts here. Uh, they, I don't think they really got as far as uh, getting the toy front end uh, built with, G, uh, with C++. Uh, nothing more than that, really. Uh, nothing significant really happened until uh, D GCC uh, was announced. Um, at some point in time, uh, D1 uh, stabilized and D2, uh, version 2 of the language, was uh, forked a few weeks later. Um, and so sort of about this time, uh, work began on the LLVM, uh, a, D, a decompiler targeting the LLVM backend. Um, the original uh, D frontend was abandoned around this time by the original author and was revived again um, by myself. Uh, about two years later. Um, so in 2015, uh, so the, the D uh, front end is implement, was implemented in C++. And around about two, 2015, we actually um, we wrote a tool to convert all the C++ sources to D. And we finally made that leap uh, then. Um, and that's eventually uh, LDC and GDC uh, followed suit. So now we have uh, you know, uh, two branches, one in C++, one in D. Um, 
So as the uh, previous uh, tree sort of alluded to, we all come from a common source. Um, so there are three major uh, compiler vendors, DMD, GDC, and LDC. They don't actually uh, implement their own interpretation of the language. Rather, they share a common front end that implements the parser and semantic analyzer for the language. Uh, this is called, for the in uh, intended purpose of this talk, the DMD front end. Uh, so what LDC, GDC, and DMD are uh, in this picture is what we call a glue layer. Uh, they consume the common front end AST, and they produce code for their respective back ends. Uh, for GDC, how this looks like in a, a typical compilation sequence. So you have a compiler uh, driver and a compiler proper. Um, the compiler proper uh, calls into GDC via some language hooks. So uh, here, for instance, the init hook, we initialize the DMD front end, as well as creating uh, various uh, trees, uh, types, and built-ins. Uh, in the pass hook, um, language pass, we uh, send all the files to the, to the DMD front end, which returns us a list of module nodes that we are to compile. Uh, for each module, um, semantic analysis is run on them. And uh, if at some point during the uh, semantic analysis, the DMD front end needs more information about the target, uh, such as uh, what's the field alignment of this type, um, it then gets that information from the glue layer, GDC, uh, via a target interface. Uh, GDC will then pass this information on to the GCC backend, and if need be, uh, convert the result back to a DMD uh, AST. Uh, once semantic analysis has finished, we then uh, walk all the AST nodes and generate trees um, for the backend to compile all the way down to assembler. Um, as a sort of, uh, in the order that we, uh, no, in order to walk the uh, AST, uh, the DMD front end provides a visitor interface which encapsulates the uh, class hierarchy of all AST nodes uh, which, which it defines. So what we then do um, in the code gen is to write our own visitor uh, functions to handle each kind of tree uh, which we want to send to GCC. Uh, what we generate or how we use visitor functions is completely independent of the DMD uh, front end. Uh, there's a lot of information going here, so I'll drill down into it. So uh, on the topmost level, we have a declaration. Um, this could be a module, in which case we generate a namespace, or it could be an import, in which case we check to see uh, if we can actually represent it uh, within debug. Uh, other kinds of uh, declaration could be a variable decal, uh, a bar decal, a function decal, or a const decal. Uh, declarations also have a type. Uh, which needs to be generated, and optionally, uh, a type decal uh, for user-defined types, such as structs, classes. Uh, type declarations, such as uh, structs and classes, also have runtime information generated for them. Um, all information is laid out into a constructor and also a, uh, an external symbol, uh, which is where, where we associate this uh, data. Uh, declarations may also have a value to initialize it, and this could also be a function, uh, in which case it needs a body to be emitted. Uh, each statement is compromised of uh, expressions. Uh, an expression may be lowered to um, a runtime function call, in which case uh, it, it, will, it, it will need a type information uh, similar to be referenced, or also uh, expressions have a type, and uh, we could also have a declaration expression, uh, which is um, you know, nested functions, um, yeah, it handles all that. Uh, so just sort of note, so de de decal visitor, expression visitor, and type visitor could call themselves recursively. Um, so, so for instance, you have a, a pointer to a pointer to an int, you'll have a, a type visitor for the pointer to pointer to int, delve into the next layer, a type visitor for the pointer to int, then a type visitor for, for just for the int. Um, for declarations and types, um, code is only generated for it once. Uh, multiple visits to the same node will return the same tree. So um, what benefits do we get from actually using uh, the, the GCC backend? So, um, firstly, uh, GCC has a wealth of built-ins, and we expose uh, as much as we can to the D language by uh, a magic module called GCC.BuiltIns. Uh, 
the module source itself is empty, uh, save for the module declaration. Um, on importing, uh, on importing this module from your uh, program, uh, we dynamically uh, we go through all the built-ins and generate AST for them and insert them into the module. Uh, do I have a quick time just sort of show this off? Maybe. Do, do, do. So we have a, uh, oh excellent, I pre-generated one. So we have a built-ins module. I want to call it syntax only because I don't want to compile it. Um, which then generates built-ins.di. And so inside this, just to sort of give a quick overview of what we have. So, um, all built-ins which have the pure attribute are marked as pure uh, in the D module. Note that not all are actually uh, done so. Um, all built-ins are marked as no throw, because uh, they are no throw in the, G, uh, in the D sense, as well as no GC. Um, built-ins that uh, have a fallback uh, so the built-ins that have a fallback function, as in, if the compiler can't do anything with it, it's low, it just calls the C function, are trusted. Um, built-ins that are expanded by the compiler are mar marked safe. Uh, we also, uh, for convenience, we have uh, some types which, um, they're basically just C type mappings to D types. Uh, we also define a VA list, um, as, along with uh, target types, and also functions. If I've got, oh, hey, three, six, two, yeah. I'll just back to took. So, um, as well as explicit built-ins, uh, we also have a core uh, standard C package, uh, which is defines uh, all the C bindings uh, from D runtime to interface with C uh, libraries. Uh, we here, we actually recognize uh, functions, um, uh, the compiler recognizes functions and maps it to their corresponding GCC built-in if one is provided. Uh, all match functions undergo the same optimizations as uh, built-ins explicitly. So here, you know, call calling uh, PAL, the compiler will optimize it away. Printf with a new, uh, new line format at the end, it'll just rewrite that as puts. This can be turned off if you pass the F no built in flag. Uh, another feature of the language is that we have uh, user defined attributes. Uh, these attributes can be queried, extracted, and manipulated at compile time. Uh, nothing extra is done here to actually uh, support this. We're just using the language itself uh, to assign these attributes. Uh, when it comes to the cogen stage, however, uh, we scan for these uh, UDAs um, and to see if there's anything matching the, the GC coming from the GC attribute module. Um, there are actually a few tr attributes that we really support uh, within the front end because the lang language itself has other ways of expressing them. Uh, the more useful a aspect of this is really just exposing target-specific attributes. Um, the D language specification also includes a section on inline assembler. Um, however, to implement this, uh, it would mean that GDC would have to, for every single target we want to support, implement our own assembler within the front end. Uh, so as a concession, um, the spec allows differing implementations to innovate. So we choose the style which most naturally uh, works for us, which is GCC syntax. Uh, the, the syntax of the ASM statements that you see uh, are pretty much provided by the D language. Um, all what we manage are just the tokens inside the braces. So, um, and, and we also take advantage of uh, the, the semantic analysis. So, uh, how the ASM parser works. Um, so, ASM statements are volatile unless you pass the pure uh, attributes. Um, output operands, uh, they are semantically checked to make sure that they are valid L values, inputs are, must be valid R values, uh, jumps 
uh, they uh, are checked to make sure that they don't break language rules, such as skipping initialization. Um, and because we're using uh, the front end semantic analyzer, uh, we also get uh, CTFE capabilities. So you can just generate uh, assembler from functions that return strings. Uh, other notable features that are probably uh, worthy of a mention but take too long to, dig to digress into. Uh, we get fantastic uh, GDB support um, along with uh, yeah, built-in runtime instrumentation. Uh, LTO is probably one of the most uh, used uh, tools by people using GDC and LDC, um, if only for the reason of keeping the binary sizes down. Um, all of which you know, comes to free with no extra work on my side to support it. So, what do I want to do for the immediate future? Uh, for the time being, I want to focus most of my uh, effort into finishing the transition from, from, from the front-end implementation from C++ to D. Uh, the, the DMD front-end itself was initially ported to D in version 2.0.6.9. Uh, however, the DMD compiler uh, converted both their front-end and their code generator, meaning that nobody ac actually tested whether the combination of a D front-end and a C++ code gen worked. Spoilers, it didn't. Um, so, so some, some of the more glaring implementation regressions uh, included the dropping of um, uh, floating point emulation, that they sort of replace all the floating point emulation with native long double. Was, why? Um, I, I managed to eventually reverse m most of this, uh, most of these problems by uh, 2072. Uh, um, however, at this point, now, in order to switch um, to the, the, D, uh, the DDMD front end, meant I had to deal with two very large changes at the same time. Not only was I changing the language, but also had to support all the new features of that language um, as well. What all I wanted to do was just to you know, have my code generator and point it to both front ends without changing any of the code generation sources. So what I ended up doing was going through every single uh, regression listed in the changelog and backporting that from D to C++. Uh, this moved on to backporting all listed bugs and eventually updating the standard library uh, to each successive version. Uh, then I moved on to the test suite. Um, so each test that did not pass, I tracked down the patch and backported that to C++. At some point, I actually caught up uh, with DMD development, and the result was I had a decompiler that supported almost every feature of the upcoming uh, 2076 release, but written in C++ instead of D. Um, last minute fixes made it into the final release of 2076, so I finally had a working base um, to which then I then removed all C++ sources, inserted them uh, D sources, and it just worked. Um, so this was done, so except for a few changes in the make files and a couple of lines of code to initialize the D runtime from C++, it was all flawless. Um, it took a while just sort of, you know, testing this before making the final jump, um, mostly just resolving problems within the bootstrapping uh, of a, a D compiler written in D. Um, but we eventually got there and it's now in the master branch and quite a lot of, it seems like a lot of changes, but it's really just, you know, remove, move. So, now we're currently maintaining two branches of GDC. Uh, the D implementation, which is tested once or twice a week uh, against both GCC trunk and the DMD nightlies. And we also have the C++ uh, implementation, which is only being kept in sync with GCC trunk. Um, we're only really any regressions, bug fixes, and new ports are going there, you know, just to help the bootstrap process of you know, first start with a C++ uh, based compiler to then build a D uh, based compiler. Um, so my intention then is to push for getting the C++ implementation into GCC as the first uh, released uh, D compiler. And then that will become the baseline for building the next version of GCC. Um, the D front end of GCC, even. Um, so that pretty much brings me up to present day and to the uh, inevitable question that I've been avoiding this entire talk. <laughs> I, 
I guess, but sort of first off, if I want, before I sort of start describing this, does anybody have any questions? Civ is the version written in D about relying on new D language features. So, will you be able to expect that the version included in GCC 10 will be able to build with the D version in GCC 9 if it gets into GCC 9 and so on? Um, I am. A lot of it has come from myself. You know, there are people who work on, on the uh, language front end who want to use the latest and greatest features as soon as possible. And I put. A, a handbrake on that, my own veto to say, no, don't do this. Um, you know, I've, uh, currently, we support being built by a comp uh, compiler as old as three years. Um, my intention is that, um, so when it, the first release of the defunct in GCC should build the next two releases. I think that is probably a reasonable uh, sort of time frame. Uh, in order to support older compilers before we then drop that uh, compiler support. So GCC 9 should be able to build GCC 11, but not GCC 12. Okay. So as for merging into GCC itself, um, so the front end, uh, as I've explained, you know, is sort of maintained in a separate repository. It has their own co contributors. What I do is just mirror those sources uh, locally into my repository. Uh, now, what came up during the initial review process uh, was that these sources are copyright the D Language Foundation under a Boost license, and uh, the person reviewing it sort of flagged it up to sort of say that um, you know uh, before we actually progress any further, we should first have Free Software Foundation approval to actually incorporate these sources under a different license. Um, and a lot of what's been holding me back is just trying to get an answer from the Free Software Foundation. You know, yes, is it okay? No, is it not? And so then I can make the appropriate um, decision on, on what to do. Either you know, push it as is or write a script to then you know, change all the uh, top of the files to be Free Software Foundation GPL. Um, I was actually supposed to talk with Richard Stallman last Saturday, uh, but having given uh, my phone number to him, uh, he then proceeded not to call me or answer any of my emails. Um, I, I did get a message from John um, yesterday saying that they will attempt to try and call me this Wednesday, so hopefully by next weekend I should you know, send a message to the mailing list, you know, giving thumbs up, say, you know, please, everybody, you know, here's the code, get reviewing, I want to get all the technical uh, blockers you know, done and dealt with, and in before November. Okay, I think that's all then. <laughs> I've got, actually got...